All right, thank you everybody for joining us for our Monday Zoom and Learn. Um, we have a Zoom and Learn that I think everybody can get some uh, value out of today because this is by far the biggest question that I get being in title. So um, my name is Tommy Dutcher, welcome. Uh, if we haven't had a chance to meet, I would ask that uh, you please feel free to reach out to me either through the Zoom here through the YouTube uh, recording, or feel free to um, uh, get me on my uh, website at tommyfortitle.com. And my co-host is Mary Jane Morris with SoCal Escrow. Mary Jane. Hey everybody, so, so happy to be with you today. I'm excited to, as I said, and just before we started a recording, I can see by the people that are here, these are the people that um, I know they are very serious about real estate. And they need to know these ins and outs. I, I don't know them as well. And when uh, Andrew was uh, prepping me for this class today, I really um, had my eyes open to what could be a scary situation. You know, one of those things where you, you wish you knew what you knew, you know, when you needed to know it kind of situation. So um, I think everybody, again, will get a little bit of something out of this. Uh, Andrew is our, you know, team attorney for the Mendes with MJ. He, gives us a tip every week, and he has been offering a ton of free consultations uh, for our clients as well. So I hope that uh, you guys will get to know him as well. He's, uh, he's very uh, friendly and easy to talk with and smart. Uh, without further ado, Andrew, take it away. Thank you, MJ. Thank you, Tommy. Really appreciate the introduction. Everyone can see the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation right now? Yes. Okay, good. So um, I'm Andrew Wertheim. I own Pacific Estate Planning, which is a professional law corporation. I am a California licensed attorney, um, a patented inventor, and a longtime business owner. I've also recently been ranked among the top two and a half percent of all attorneys, uh, regardless of practice area, for the entire region of Southern California. So I uh, really love what I do, uh, which is primarily estate planning, trust and estate administration, probate, and various uh, business law. Um, and I can assist with real property matters as well. Today, I wanna to talk about deeds. Um, and in particular, uh, when the deed may be outright lying to you, uh, the inspiration for this presentation came from my memory of when I first bought my first home uh, over a decade ago, if you can believe it. Uh, and I remember when I bought that first home, um, I was asked by the mobile notary, how do you wanna own that home? What form of title do you want? And I remember thinking, gosh, I'm in my third year of law school and I don't know the answer. Uh, of course, I'm asking the mobile notary what he thinks. He has no idea, <laughs> right? So I did what we all do. I took a guess and it turned out that that guess was wrong. And thank God I went into this profession and I was able to fix it. Uh, but I know that most people aren't afforded that opportunity. And so I really wanted to kind of get this information out to all of you. And I wanted to try to stop the cycle of us letting people buy homes with no advice on how to take title to them. Uh, when you're in that situation, uh, I don't want you to give legal advice that puts you at risk, right? I want you to call me or have them call me and I will talk to them for 10 to 15 minutes at no charge just to help guide them. Um, I just, I'm very passionate about this and making sure we make the right decisions. And I think that's partly maybe why uh, MJ and, and Tommy like me so much and hand selected me for this, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, but just want to be there for you, okay? Um, I should say uh, this presentation, I'm not giving legal advice. Um, these are expressions of my learned opinion. Uh, and everyone should get their own attorney. Um, part of that is because everyone's circumstances are unique, uh, particularly the family dynamics are very unique. And uh, it's just impossible to give a one hour presentation that's going to solve everything for everyone. Uh, but I want to give you a lot of substantive information so you can have a healthy respect for the subject and reach out when you need help. So let's meet Jim and Carol. Uh, Jim and Carol are married. They're young, beautiful, and naive and have no idea what they're about to do, uh, which is buy a house. And we're going to assume you're their realtor and they're going to ask you, or hopefully they ask someone, how should I hold title to that house? And of course, there's many options, right? The first one is tenants in common. And then we get to uh, Jim or Carol's soul and separate property. Maybe, maybe Jim has better credit and, and they're under the mistaken impression that if only his name is on the loan, then only his name can be on title, uh, which is not true, uh, but happens quite often. 
so maybe it's one of their separate properties or Jim bought it with uh, separate property funds that he acquired before he got married to Carol, who knows, right? But that's a way to, of holding title. He can hold title as joint tenancy, with has, which has a right of survivorship or community property with right of survivorship or just plain community property. Of course, uh, they could hire someone like me and put it into a trust. And then you can also own property um, either through a company or through an irrevocable trust. And we're not gonna cover either of those today, but that is another option. Well, what do all these mean? You know, if Jim dies, let's say, what happens depending on the various forms of title? And in particular, I wanna warn uh, against tenants in common. I've had three situations come up in the past month and a half uh, where we had uh, two realtors, um, an escrow company and a title company, and I'm looking at the deed and it's just, the grantees are just Jim and Carol. No husband and wife, no joint tenancy, no community property with right of survivorship, nothing. And I should say, neither Mary Jane or Tommy were involved in any of those transactions, <laughs> okay? They know better. Uh, but for whatever reason, this kept on popping up. And the default in California, if you don't choose a form of ownership, it's going to be tenants in common. And there's some problems with tenants in common. So if it's tenants in common, Jim and Carol, and Jim dies, um, we're essentially saying Carol owns half the house. And we don't know who owns Jim's portion of the house. If Jim has a will, then Jim is going to choose who owns that half of the house. And we're gonna to have to go through a probate court proceeding. And if Jim's ownership of the house is worth $500,000, let's say fair market value, that'll be a $30,000 probate court proceeding. And it'll take about one to three years to get it done to find out who gets Jim's half of the house. Um, if Jim does not have a will, then we're gonna go through the intestate statutes. Um, maybe that means it goes to Carol, um, but I'll tell you, if Jim has two children, um, then what's going to happen is Carol is going to get one third of his portion, and then his two other children are going to get the other two thirds of his portion after going through a $30,000 or more probate court proceeding that will take one to three years, right? And if his children are minors, well, that's, gosh, that's really tough because now we have to go appoint guardians of the estate for each minor and get court approval to do anything with their portion of the house. If they're not minors, if they're adults, well, that's still problematic. Who gets to live there? We have three owners of the property now. Who pays uh, rent to whom? Uh, how do we share the utilities or the home insurance or the state property taxes? It gets really complicated very quickly as part of the problems of owning it as tenants in common. Uh, similarly, if it's Jim's sole and separate property, uh, either because he was worried about divorce and he bought it with with funds he acquired before the marriage or with an inheritance or, or whatever, or just because they mistakenly put it in there because of better credit or whatever it may be, we have to determine if he dies, does it go to Carol? Did he have a will and gave it to someone else? Um, does he have other children or parents or other heirs that could get part of this property? Uh, leads to a lot of problems and a lot of court proceedings. Um, if it's in joint tenancy, it's far simpler. We have a right of survivorship now. So if Jim dies, it's gonna go straight to Carol. And that's why I think joint tenancy is recommended so often, uh, but there are problems with joint tenancy, which we will get to in this presentation. Uh, but at least on the first death, nice and simple, Jim dies, it goes to Carol. And then if Carol dies without putting that house into a trust, well, then we're gonna to go to probate court. And we're gonna spend that $30,000 or more <laughs> and spend one to three years in order to figure out who gets that property. So it doesn't solve the problem completely. It's just a Band-Aid that helps pass it from the first house to the second, but really they should be putting it into a trust. Then you have community property with right of survivorship, very similar to joint tenancy. If Jim dies, everything goes to Carol. And then if Carol dies, we go to probate court. But as we'll see, there are huge differences between joint tenancy and community property. That'll be the second portion of this presentation. And then community property only is fascinating to me. All right, no right of survivorship here. So what are you saying? You're saying that Jim owns half the house and Carol owns half the house, but, but as a married couple. And so essentially we're going to presume it's gonna to go to Carol, but it doesn't have to. So what if Jim has a girlfriend named Sarah and he writes a will 
and he says in his will, handwritten will, is, Carol has no idea about it, right? And he says, I want all of my house to go to Sarah, my girlfriend. That house is going to go to Sarah. We're going to go to probate court and we're going to uh, follow through on the will. And now <laughs> Kara and Sarah are going to live together. Who knows, right? Maybe we force a sale of the house, kick Carol out, or Carol has to pay rent to Sarah or whoever. Uh, we don't know. Uh, so that absolutely could happen if Jim's a little sneaky and, and wills it to Sarah. Well, what happens, okay, what's more typically going to happen is Carol's going to come to someone like me or someone like Tommy or MJ and, and, and say, um, of course the house goes to me. Honestly, I'm a little insulted that you would assume it go to someone else. I'm the wife. I've been married to Jim for 40 years. And of course the house is going to go to me. How do we get it in my name? And we're going to tell Carol, well, you have a couple of options. Uh, the first option is, if you're OK with it, we'll have you uh, swear under penalty of perjury that Jim didn't have a will and that there's no one with a superior right. We're going to go ahead and record that. And we're going to give you the house. But you are going to be personally liable if there's any problems down the line. Because there may be a creditor of Jim's that we don't know about. And they may sue you for the portion of this house. Or there could be an heir with a superior right to the house than you. And then Carol's going to go, what, an heir with a superior right? I'm the wife. Who could possibly have a superior right to me? And my answer is going to be, well, the divorce rate is 50% or more. And in my experience, uh, people will start a divorce and never finish it. Either they didn't hire an attorney, so they never got it done right. Or they hired an attorney and they ran out of money, so they never actually got a divorce judgment. And I have seen people in my office who were you know, married for 40 years happily in love absolutely and then i go and i look and uh we don't have a divorce judgment of the previous ex-wife janet and so he's actually still married to janet uh whereas carol and jim thought they'd been married for 40 years and they're in fact not married we got to go follow through and get that divorce of janet done first and so in this situation can janet go sue carol to get half this house potentially yeah and so that's the risk of doing this cheaper 13 540 affidavit procedure now, if Carol wants to not look over the, her shoulder for the rest of her life and make sure this house goes to her, then we do a spousal property petition under 13650. It's, it's going to be more money. I don't know if it's 5000 or 10000 somewhere in that range. Part of that goes to the attorney and part of that goes to the court. But if we follow through on that, we have a judge signing an order saying this house is now Carol's and no one has a superior right. And there's a lot of closure there. So those are the two options uh, when it's just community property. And again, if they just hire me or someone like me to put this house into a trust, no court action, and everything you just learned, you could just throw it away, right? It's that simple. But until everyone gets a trust, this is, this is what we're left with and what we have to know. Andrew, do um, both those uh, 13540 and 13650 fall under the probate code? Yep, those are both uh, California probate code sections. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if we just, put the house into a trust, then Jim and Carol can put into the trust exactly who's going to get it, likely each other and then the kids. And we avoid court, we avoid the 30,000 or more probate fees and it's just happy. Uh, so that's uh, typically what we're gonna wanna do. Now, what lets me tell you with such certainty what happens when someone dies and we have all these forms of ownership? Obviously I'm an attorney, I am telling you exactly what will happen depending on the form of ownership. How do I know that? I know that because of evidence code 662, we have a form of title presumption in California. And essentially what it says is when someone dies, we look at the deed and we assume that the deed story of who owns the house is true. So we can trust in the deed. And then we apply the law from there. But it's not that easy because evidence code section 662 only applies at death. And we can have many transfers that occur during life. And then it's a whole set of new worlds, okay? So either a sale or a gift or a divorce or a bankruptcy with a foreclosure, those are transfers during life. Does evidence code 662 apply? You're gonna find probably not. And so then we have to look at a whole new set of rules. We have a community uh, property presumption in this state. All property acquired during the marriage is presumed to be community property unless given by gift or inheritance. 
Um, and then we have this evidence code form of title presumption that applies on, on death. So what applies during life, community property or evidence code 662? First, why do we care? Why does it matter? Here's why. When we have property and joint tenancy, there is uh, huge credit protection. Uh, so if Jim and Carol are married and they own the house as joint tenants and Jim uh, on his own gets sued by a creditor, that creditor can only attach to Jim's half of the house. So potentially we could save half the house from being taken in this uh, creditor action. Uh, whereas, uh, well, okay, and that's gonna be important. You know, maybe Jim's a gambler or he's a lawyer like me and people like to sue lawyers or he's a doctor and uh, he gets sued because he's a surgeon and he hurt somebody by accident or he's a truck driver and accidentally kills someone in a car accident or he's a criminal and he harms someone. All of those circumstances, he's gonna be very happy if, if he and his wife own the house as joint tenants because the creditor can only go after his 50% of the house and can't touch Carol's. But on the other hand, community property has advantages too. We get a double step up in tax basis when the first spouse dies with community property. And that's really relevant. Um, usually the husband passes away first and then the wife lives in the home for five to 10 years later. And then she'll sell the house to afford a nursing home, uh, nursing home care. Uh, she's going to lose uh, his $250,000 capital gains exclusion under IRC 121. So there could be a capital gain on that sale. And I've seen by owning as community property and having a double step up a basis, I mean, it could save ten to $30,000 in capital gains taxes on the sale of that home uh, when the uh, survivor goes to sell it. So there are huge potential tax savings for having community property. And then there are huge potential credit protection for having an enjoint tenancy. And it's really important to make a um, informed decision about which one you want. And then you have all these presumptions that come into play depending on whether we're in a divorce proceeding, a death event, or a bankruptcy. So Jim and Carol wanna buy their house. They're going to use community property funds to buy the house as most of us do. And they're going to take title as joint tenants. Do they own it as joint tenants or do they own it as community property? Which presumption are we going to use because they are directly conflicting, right? And whichever one wins is going to determine, do we get that double step up of basis or do we get the credit of protection? So is it presumptively community because we use community funds or is it presumptively separate property because we took title as joint tenancy and that's what the deed says, which one? Well, uh, it turns out that what's said on the deed uh, may not control. We may be ignoring the deed completely. So we have a new California Supreme Court case called In Ray Brace and they evaluate everything. They gave us some really good answers and they confirmed, look, if someone dies, we're going by evidence code 662. Form of title is going to control. We will pay attention to the deed to presume the deed is accurate. If it says joint tenants and someone passes away, it's joint tenants. So we're gonna give it to the, survivor, to the surviving joint tenant. If we're in a divorce proceeding, then we're ignoring the deed. Don't care about the deed at all. We're looking to see what was the source of the funds that were used to make that purchase. We're gonna presume it's community property and that's going to affect child support, and spousal support and what uh, one spouse can do with or without the consent of the other spouse. And then they said, okay, but this is new to us. What happens in a bankruptcy proceeding? And In Ray Brace was directly analyzing uh, all these issues under the framework of a bankruptcy uh, proceeding. And essentially they had to decide which one of these presumptions is going to apply for bankruptcy. Uh, because again, if the property is separate, then we can only attach to 50% of the house, but if it's community, then the creditor can attach to the full value of the house. So which one are we going to do? And I, I put kind of the, all the various holdings of the court in here, but really the answer is um, the court basically recognized there is so little guidance given to buyers today. This is actually the court saying this. There is so little guidance given to buyers today that people don't understand the differences between joint tenancy and community property. And if they're married, we, the judges of California are going to assume they meant to take it as community property as married couples because no one's telling them different. And so we'll give them the tax benefit and we will take away the credit protection from them. 
and we're going to ignore the deed uh, entirely. Uh, so if it says joint tenancy on the deed, we don't care. We're going to presume it's community property, no credit protection. And that's just the way we're going to do it because we got to make a decision and, and the common buyer has no idea. So this is what we're going to choose for them. And uh, we still want to give a, a, a solution to those savvy buyers and uh, they can certainly still do joint tenancy. Uh, but you know what we're going to do? We're going to make them get a transmutation agreement under section 852. Uh, so if we have buyers who are savvy enough uh, to hire two different attorneys, one to represent the husband, one to represent the wife, and we form a transmutation agreement specifically saying this is actually joint tenancy property, then we'll pay attention to it. We'll let it be joint tenancy. And what is a transmutation agreement? Um, it has a negative connotation. It's a post-nup or it's a prenup. That's how we typically think of and know of what a transmutation agreement is. But in this circumstance, it's not really negative. We're not trying to uh, separate property in the event of a divorce here. We're just trying to let the buyers make an informed decision. Do they want the tax benefit or do they want the creditor protection? It's going to be 50-50 ownership by the spouses either way, but let them choose what is more important to them. Um, but when you do this, you need two different attorneys. Uh, you need to provide the transmutation to both spouses and then give them seven days to look it over. And then after seven days, both spouses and both attorneys sign it. And now you have an effective transmutation agreement. It's really the only way to make it effective in California. Um, and so that's how, uh, that is the only way I know of right now to actually choose joint tenancy uh, in California to get that credit protection. And so this is the court, just their reasoning and, and, and saying how we go about doing that. So to recap, we have this kind of war of presumptions. Evidence code 662. If someone dies, we look at the deed, the deed controls. If someone divorces, we ignore the deed. We look at the source of funds used to acquire that property. If someone goes bankrupt, we ignore the deed. We're looking uh, partially to the source of funds, but more importantly, were they married when they bought it? We as judges know better than buyers. We know they're not getting guidance on this. We're just gonna assume it's community property unless we have a transmutation agreement to tell us otherwise. Excuse me one second. For my visual learners, I wanna show you what a deed looks like. So here we have Shea Home Limited Partnership granting to Jean Moore and Sharon Moore, husband and wife as joint tenants. So now we see a deed that's giving it to them as joint tenants. Again, if Jean dies, it will go to Sharon through the joint tenancy. If Jean and Sharon divorce, we ignore this deed. We're gonna see the source of funds. If Jean and Sharon go bankrupt, we're gonna ignore this deed and we're gonna presume it's actually community property so that there's no credit or protection unless they have a transmutation agreement in place. So, if they bought it with community funds and it says joint tenants, do they own it as joint tenants? No. Why does that matter? Because if Gene gets sued, the creditor can take the entire house. How do they get creditor protection? They write up a transmutation agreement with two different attorneys. And that will change it from a community property to separate property. What will eventually happen if they don't place this property into a trust? A probate court proceeding. If the house is worth $500,000, probate court proceeding will generally cost around 30 grand. It also, by the way, puts a, a real strain on the family because, you know, let's say Jim and Carol die and their, their daughter, Kim, wants to get the house. She'll get the house eventually, um, but she'll have to personally pay for Jim and Carol's bills for maybe six months or eight months because Jim and Carol's money is all frozen. So the state property taxes, the home insurance, the utilities, everything, we have this daughter personally paying, hoping to get paid at the end. And it's very uncomfortable. <clears throat> I've had clients that are uh, 60 or $80,000 in debt, just waiting to get paid. And it's uh, very stressful. A trust solves all these problems. Okay, third party owners. Jim and Carol are back and they're still married. They wanna buy an investment property with Carol's sister, Jane. The house is worth a million dollars. 
Jim and Carol pay 500. Jane pays 500,000. And they take title, Jim, Carol, and Jane as joint tenants. Excuse me. <coughs> so Jim dies. Does Carol own a half and Jane own the other half? No, no. The court's actually likely going to determine that Jim and Carol were not joint tenants. Remember, we're gonna presume that they don't know what joint tenancy means and they actually meant to take it as community property. So we're gonna presume that uh, Jim and Carol own two thirds and Jane owns one third. But Jane paid half the price of the house. Isn't that a problem? Yeah, it's probably gonna be a problem. And it'll be really interesting to see how this gets uh, uh, played out in the, in the coming years with the courts, because I could just see court battles coming in the future and we don't really have a good answer for it right now. Uh, so hopefully uh, someone <laughs> warns Jane before she puts up half the money. Okay, the house is worth a million. Jim and Carol pay 500,000. Jane pays 500,000. They take title, Jim, Carol, and Jane as joint tenants and Jane dies. <clears throat> does the property transfer to Jim and Carol via joint tenancy? No, because remember Jim and Carol own it, community property with right of survivorship, which means that the joint tenancy is severed in regards to Jane. So she owns it as a tenant in common. Jane dies, now Jim and Carol have to go through a probate court proceeding to figure out what happens to Jane's one third of the home. And they won't get closure on that for probably a year. And we don't know who will own Jane's portion. It may not be Jane's family, could be a creditor of Jane and that creditor may force, may force a sale. So we really wanna make sure that we're getting some guidance on, on, on all these uh, forms of ownership. Probably what I would recommend in this situation, Jim and Carol get a trust and we put their portion of the house into a trust and then Jane get her own trust. We put her portion of the house into her trust and we just have two trusts owning various portions of this property and then we don't have any problems. Yeah, or we can put it into an LLC. Either way, it's either we put it into a revocable trust or, or an LLC, and uh, I can assist with either. So when do you call me? I don't expect you to memorize this. I, I really hope you got value from it, but essentially I just want you to have a healthy respect for it because um, at least I think it's very complicated. And it took me several years really to master it as I have mastered it now. Uh, so my hope is for every transaction, if you're representing the buyer, uh, call me. Let me go through this with them for 10 to 15 minutes, no charge. I just, I remember when I was in the buyer's shoes buying my house and I sure wish someone had given me this guidance and I want to help. So my number is 951-972-7508. Are there any questions? Can you, can you put that question. last screen? Sorry. Can you put that last? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yeah. Go ahead and leave it there, Andrew, for a little bit, um, just so that they can get time to write it down. Uh, but can you speculate on uh, the range? Because I know it, it's hard for an attorney to give an exact cost of how much it is to draw up a trust, et cetera, because everybody's needs is different. And based on everyone's needs and how much data has to go into the trust, obviously, breaks down to how much it's gonna cost. But for people out there when, especially agents, when they're kind of out there with buyers and trying to encouraging the buyers that, you know, are a freshly married couple out buying their first home, et cetera, have one child and the importance that they should establish a trust. Um, where's that start? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because there is quite a range. Um, I find that most attorneys uh, tend to charge about $2,500 to $5,000 for, for a full estate plan, uh, depending on what's involved. And the estate plan is, it, it includes a trust, but it's also more than a trust. It's nominating guardians for children. Um, it's also appointing healthcare agents, uh, make medical decisions if you're in the hospital, unable to make your own medical decisions. Um, and it's also allowing a financial agent to manage your retirement accounts because often we don't put retirement accounts into a trust because of tax reasons. So it, it affects all of these different aspects of your life to protect you during your life and after death. Um, I know I typically charge $3,000 for an estate plan. I'm more thorough <laughs> than a lot of my colleagues uh, and put in a lot of extra documents to help prevent a trust contest in the future. 
Um, so hopefully that kind of gives a range and some guidance. But gosh, if, if you're going to pay $3,000 today as opposed to thirty dollars or $50,000 in the future, I would hope that's an easy decision to make. Well, and people need to realize as well as this is a one-time thing, you know, as your life progresses through different stages, you're going to update the trust, right? Uh, you buy another house, you have it, you have the title company and the escrow company record that into the trust name at closing. Um, you, you go buy an investment property, same thing, right? You um, open up a, a, a mutual fund account, you, you update you know, your financials within the trust, things like that. This is something that is going to be an ongoing uh, progression throughout your life, but it's always the protection of, of the trust is always going to be there for you. Absolutely. And I, you know, when I draft an estate plan for my clients, my hope is that they never have to amend it or change it uh, because people get afraid. Oh gosh, am I going to have to pay you another $3,000 down the line to amend this or change this? And the goal is no. And if you do need to make changes, it won't be 3000. It'll be more like 500. And uh, maybe, you know, right before you retire, we make a couple changes and then we're done, but you will acquire more assets throughout your life. And what Tommy's referring to is you, that doesn't mean you'll have to hire someone like me to help you fund those assets, um, you will just need to use, uh, we call it a trust certification. It's just a document that you would prefer, that you would give to like Tommy and, and, and MJ uh, in the escrow to put the property into your trust as part of the escrow. Or if you get a new bank account, you give it to the bank and they could put it into that trust. So you're not, it's not like a trap where you're constantly paying the attorney over time. Uh, every time you get a new piece of property, uh, you would only pay the attorney if you want to change like who your trustee is or who you want to inherit from you, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. but uh, I have a question, Andrew. So very often when the wife comes to sell, using your example that the husband has passed and the wife stays in the house and um, now she's the sole owner, you know, we do about 90% of those with no, nothing more than an affidavit of death of a uh, joint tenant. Um, uh, that is potentially reversible if debts and things come to, I'm, I'm wondering what happens when the acts continue before it's figured out that one of those consequences, how, how is a consequence uh, detected in a simple situation? Yeah, well, if it's if they own it in joint, as joint tenants, I think you're pretty safe, Mary Jane, because um, you just do it. You're going to record an affidavit of joint tenant. There's a clear right of survivorship, and it's just going to flow. The place where you're going to have trouble is when the when the joint tenant then passes away. Then you're going to have a probate court proceeding if it's not placed into a trust. The risk is if it's Jim and Carol owning it as community property. There's no right of survivorship there right? There's either community property or there's community property with the right of survivorship. So if they just own it as their community property, then we have a concern. We can do an affidavit of surviving spouse, which I think is what you were, what you were referencing. And we record that, but that surviving spouse will have personal liability if someone sues. And so how will that come out? Well, someone's going to say, hey, actually, uh, I'm the girlfriend and Jim willed this house to me. And so now I'm going to go to court and I'm going to sue Carol to to get this half of the house. And a judgment that had was pre-existing or becomes part of it, um, pre-existing is pretty easy because we, we can catch that. Um, I'm wondering when they have uh, debts and liens that we, we weren't aware of um, by continuing uh, their acts, whether I'm causing them any. Yeah, so creditors have um, up to a year to initiate a probate court procedure to um, to attach uh, to the uh, the assets of the estate, and this would be a circumstance where we have the estate of Jim, and there's half a house in that estate, and uh, it could be beneficial to actually purposely or voluntarily do a probate court action on that to make sure we root out any creditors and. Uh, make sure there's a statute of limitations so there's no liability in the future. Um, the next question I have for you is probably a tax question and I was gonna save it till the end so I don't waste anyone's time, but uh, I have a situation right now where the, um, the wife has been on title by herself. She bought it by herself originally. She's now married. 
Um, they are netting over 500,000. Now the question has come up whether, if you're, if you're not on the deed, whether the 500,000 applies. Um, would you have any insight for that on that? Yeah, thank you for that question. So, you know, the house is in the wife's name only, but she's married now. And can we get the full $500,000 IRC 121 capital gains exclusion? Because under IRC 121, each spouse has a $250,000 coupon and uh, against capital gains for the primary residence. And can we use that um, for this new spouse? Um, what would we do there? I need if to review the statute. Personal experience, the answer would be yes. Um, it, it, it's based on it's based on current uh, whatever it is at current time. So, i.e., my spouse purchased a home before we were married. I had a home before we were married. We moved into one of those homes. We ended. We got married. We ended up selling one of those homes. And we did benefit from the 500,000 because we were married. It all comes down to how you're filing your taxes. If you're filing them married separate, then no. If you're fire, filing married joint, then yes. That, 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 that was from my CPA. Um, no, that makes sense to me. And we'd also look to see, uh, have you been living in the home? I think you have to live there two out of the past five years. Two of the past five years, correct. Um, yeah, so. I just didn't if, and I wouldn't have recommended anyway. But um, it did come up as to whether we need to deed him on to before close of escrow yeah. and him conduct his acts through through the transaction. No, you do not. Um, I have a question too, um, because this comes up quite often. Is life happens, and uh, husband and wife own a property. And then they end up going through divorce. And in that process of going through divorce, they never changed how title was being held. So they still held title as a community property with rights to survivorship. And then the husband goes off and the wife is still living in the house. And the husband all of a sudden down the road has uh, judgments for credit judgments and things like that that come to, into play. And then the wife decides to sell the property and gets hit with judgments. And the importance of trying to keep your deeds as accurate and up to date as possible when life happens. What's your thoughts on that? Because, you know, she didn't know about these judgments. Obviously, they weren't living together, they were um, separated and then divorced. And um, ultimately because he still held title on that property and it was held in a way that didn't protect them from creditors. Uh, when she went to sell the property, she got hit with paying off a, a big chunk. Mm -hmm. of debt. Well, I'm, I'm not a family law attorney. However, I do believe I know the answer to this one. And in California, if we have a divorce judgment, so the divorce is finalized, then all property that we own uh, we, we sever the community property so that it is separate property. Uh, the only exception to that are retirement accounts because that falls under the ERISA uh, federal laws and federal law preempts our California laws. Um, but my opinion is as soon as that divorce was finalized, we don't care what's on the deed. Uh, it's basically tenants in common for both of them. And if the husband has creditors that came uh, after that divorce judgment, then my opinion is those creditors can only go after the husband's half of the house, even if the deed currently says joint tenants or community property or whatever it may be. Right, but that half of that house may not be going to him. It may be all going to her, but yet mm. he may have uh, racked up 50 to 100 grand mm -hmm. of debt mm -hmm. that needs to then get paid off. It comes out of half of that property. Sure. No, that yeah. makes sense yeah. too. So then we would go by the divorce judgment or the marital settlement agreement. If she has hundred percent of the property then the creditor should not be able to attach to that property because yeah. they're his debts and he doesn't own it. From a title perspective, I'll leave people with this as well. Um, especially for agents that are helping um, uh, clients out there, but also in your personal life, you know, if, if you have family members that are, uh, 
of age where they're retired now. They may not be with us longer than the next 10, 15 years. Please look out for their best interest and ask the question whether they have a trust or not. I can't tell you, this happens to me being in the title business on the weekly, on the weekly that family members pass away unexpectedly a lot of times. And the way that title's being held doesn't put anybody left in a good position, right? And I see properties go to probate more so than not, right? Because people don't understand that you could have a will and that's still not keeping you out of probate court. A will is just somebody's living testament to let you know what they would like to do with it, but they haven't acted on those to take initiative to physically move it into an entity like a trust that can hold ownership rights. And people think they're okay just with the will and you're not. It, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, is it may not be as drug out of a probate process, but you're still going to be in a probate situation if you only have a will in play. It will still be the full probate process. So there's basically three paths. You either have nothing at all, you have a will but no trust, or you have a will and a trust. And if you pass away with nothing at all, full probate court, 30 to $50,000 or more, one to three years, and California chooses who inherits from you. Yeah. If you have a will, same thing, same cost, same time, same court, but at least you get to choose who inherits from you. And then if you have a trust and you choose who inherits from you at exactly the right ages and under the right terms and no court at all. Yeah. So and, you, can uh, have a you can have a trustee, but no will and you're good. No probate. True. Yeah. Okay. So we always like to write wills in conjunction with. So the, so the question was, can you have a uh, trust with a trustee and no will and still avoid court? And the answer is yes. However, the answer I don't know. Is both. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know any of my colleagues that wouldn't also write a will at the same time uh, because we want what's called a pour over provision in that will. Right. That is very common, unfortunately, for people to create a trust and not put their property in it. And very few of my colleagues are as uh, thorough as I am to make sure we actually put every asset into it. Unfortunately, it's something I've just seen in my profession. And if the asset's not in the trust, we're going to end up in probate court anyway. So one, we really want to make sure that we put our assets into that trust and your attorney should be guiding you on how to do that. But two, we want that pour over will in case there was a mistake, it lets the judge put the assets into the trust for you after a full probate court proceeding. So it's an imperfect backup, but it helps. And that was a perfect question because that was my next one. Is, <laughs> you know, a, a lot of times that's the first thing we ask, you know, somebody did a refinance. Uh, this just happened two weeks ago. Somebody did a refinance literally within days of that refinance being done, passed away. Had multiple houses, most of them were in the trust. During the refinance, it was pulled out of the trust. Mistakenly was not put back into the trust. And they did not have a pour over will. The pour over will basically is stating that any real property that I own that's not in my trust belongs to my trust. And then it allows you to get a court order to have the judge then move it into the trust. Well, they didn't have one. So not a good situation, obviously. They have a property floating out in limbo that now belongs to a deceased individual and not to the trust anymore, right? Even though they can show documentation, it was in the trust for many years, it was pulled out of the trust and it was pulled out and they did uh, a cash out refinance and never put it back in. So very important, if you are going to get a trust, please make sure that you ask for a pour over will as well, because that's there as a protection umbrella over that trust to help you in the instance that you may have forgot to put something in. You may have a bank account, you may have some stocks, bonds, mutual funds, anything like that, that you accidentally forgot to put into your trust or list in your trust. And that will is there to pretty much protect it, even though you do have to go through a process of court order. And I see it all the time in the title business. I agree with that 100%. And your estate planning attorney should also uh, have a very detailed trust schedule A on the trust and also a separate document called a general assignment. Uh, both of those documents allow us to do something that's called a Hegstead proceeding, 
um, which is a um, far shorter court process that allows you to put those assets into the trust. It does the same thing as a pour over will, but it's faster and cheaper. And I'm doing uh, a couple of those right now. Actually, Tom, you sent me one of those. Um, yeah. It's going very well. I have a question. Yes. So I have a potential um, listing. It's um, a sister. The, so the sister died and now she is the trustee of the property. Do I, before I can even list that, do I, do, do I need to refer her to an attorney or something like? Y yes, you do. Uh, because okay. we need to um, do an affidavit of death of trustee and put the uh, property into the new trustee's name. Um, and also you should have an estate attorney review the trust to make sure that your client is the trustee and has the power to uh, manage that property. Um, we also want to determine who are we gonna distribute those funds to um, when we're done. And before we list that property for sale, I very much want to write um, an agreement between all the beneficiaries uh, saying essentially, uh, we think the house is going to sell for X. Uh, we think it's going to cost Y to repair it enough so that we can sell it at a good price. And uh, we think that the trustee is going to take a fee of Z and that we plan on distributing the money and you know, this time frame to these individuals and please everybody sign here so that once the trustee does this action of selling a house which she or he will never be able to take back no one can then sue that person for doing a bad job right we want to make sure everyone's in agreement before we sell that house because otherwise there's no take backs and uh, if you give someone a lot of money uh, in a trust distribution and it turns out they're unhappy with you all you've done is funded them so they can now sue you for more and I really want to get that agreement in place. Yeah, I mean, I have I have a situation right now where um, individual passed away. The trustee of the trust um, is trying to sell the property, didn't uh, seek legal. Um, obviously, there are certain things from a title perspective that we asked for. Some Andrew just mentioned, um, and the other thing that we would need is obviously the entire trust. From a title perspective because we need to see who has rights to that particular property and how the funds need to be distributed uh, once the property is sold and that it's capable of being sold we've seen trust before where a property is listed in the trust that says this this property can never be sold it will be for family use only and um you know so we need to see that and right now we're in a situation where we have a half a trust and the portion that we need that shows um who would have rights to the property is nowhere to be found. And from a title perspective, we will not move forward from that, right? The trustee has the rights to fulfill the wishes of the trust. They're not owners of the trust. Mm -hmm. So without, what verbiage, what verbiage do I use to, to this potential seller who is the trustee of the property that's left behind from her sister's death? Well, I mean, from from an escrow and a title perspective, I think is uh, getting the appropriate documentation up front. And that would be the first thing I always ask for is a full copy of the trust. Um, the next thing that escrow is going to want is going to be a trust cert. Right. So certifying that the trust is indeed and that we have full copies of it and all the other stuff. Then we need the affidavits that Andrew had mentioned and but the biggest thing is the full copy of the trust, because that's going to tell us exactly who the trustee is. Is there more than one trustee? Is, um, you know, and then obviously it's going to dictate uh, what, what transpires with that property. If the property is able to be sold, one, who the funds are being left to and how they're being distributed, two, um, and things like that. And without having all that, from a title perspective, we would not move forward. Shelley, what you're going to tell the seller is this is a legal document. This trust is a legal document. You need an attorney to read it and advise you properly because if you make a mistake, you'll be held personally liable. And uh, I don't want that for you. And also, I very much want to list this property for you, but we could spend all this time and money and repairs and enlisting the house for sale. And I could have seven buyers for you. We negotiate and we do a bidding war and I get you this amazing price and then we can't close because we didn't have an attorney involved on day one. Here's Andrew's number. 
please give him a call. That's what, <laughs> that's what I want you to tell her, right? Because I can solve so many problems before they start. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you so much. So if we have a title issue and we, we can see it, right? Because we, of course, always order the title report before we take the listing or at, at the time we take the listing. Um, and you can see it's a huge mess. Do you just start with title and see what they have and give them the information? Or should we just go right to you uh, as the attorney and just say, we need you to fix it? Or, you know, I mean, I've had some, it's, it's a huge mess and I can see it's a huge mess. Well, and I'm just wondering what we should do first. Typically what would happen is you get a listing, we open title, we get a prelim. Your title person calls you and says, here's what I found in the prelim. This isn't good. And if it were me, I would be directing you to Andrew. Yeah, when, when they're still alive, sometimes um, I'm able to write correction deeds to fix the problem, uh, particularly if they're still alive and well with us. Uh, when someone passes away, uh, then likely I, I, I'm going to have to go to court. Um, but I'll tell you, anytime I get a call, um, and Tommy knows this, anytime I get a call and I see some, some interesting deeds, I tend to call Tommy uh, and we, we work on it together because I really value him. He has insight that I would I wouldn't normally see. So it would be a, it would be a combined effort. Um, we want to help. Um, an example of that I just ran into last week was we um, have a deed that put the property into um, a limited liability corporation. And there's no such thing. There's only a corporation. There's a limited liability company. So we're going to have to figure out <laughs> you know, how do we fix that one. So luckily they're alive oh, and well. We should be able to. Online forms. Yeah. One of the uh, one of the reasons that I am comfortable working with Andrew is because for all the attorneys we speak to from the escrow and title side, um, most of them, many of them, are not considering. That we have. Sorry, my phone dropped off the charger. Um, most of them are not considering that we are going to need to have title insurance and that they'll have requirements of their own and proofs they need and that sort of thing. So um, I've been grateful that uh, Andrew understands the important part that title plays as far as we're concerned. Um, and um, with that with that background search, they also give him many things he already knows, but maybe something he doesn't know um, as well, judgments, that sort of thing that we we wouldn't have seen necessarily in the first run um, of the preliminary title report since we don't do the statement of identity. Here comes my pitch, which is why we love to pre-escrow our transactions. So we have a chance to get the statement of identity and those sort of things in into the title company. Um, so I want to I want to thank you for that, Andrew. It's very important that you understand that I have to have title insurance or I'm not going to be able to sell this a particular property. Unless it's cash, and then they can make a mess all they want. <laughs> And then there was another warning that may or may not be appropriate here, but I think uh, Tommy, I, and certainly Andrew has heard an earful of it. We've had so many lost trusts in the last 12 months. I just am going nuts looking for trust. Now, we have many senior citizens who are cashing out on properties they got from a trust to a trust that originally was mom and dad's trust. I, I am honestly in one case alone four trusts deep into, um, in, yeah. into and, and the two original trusts um, that gave them the property were 10, 15, 20 years ago, and they're saying they don't have a clue where to get that trust. Um, usually, unfortunately, and I'll, I hope you'll take it as a joke, when, I, when, when they realize how much it's going to take financially to locate that trust, I sometimes get a little more motivated party, um, and they will occasionally come up with the trust, but um, families should be remembered to keep copies of all trusts that are important to their assets. If you receive something from a trust, you're going to need a copy of that trust um, as well. Not to mention, we may have to do some affidavits, death or uh, whatever. Um, in our case, it's mostly been vacant land. And so nobody thought it was important, if you will, as opposed to a, a structure. But uh, don't lose your trust. There's there's no place to there's no trust repository, and even if there was, we wouldn't know if they updated it. Yeah, I'm also having to dig up attorneys that have passed, and their daughters and children to go through their boxes to look for copies of trust. So I just wanted to throw in the don't lose your trust 
uh, warning in there while I'm at it. Yeah, a little um, uh, word of advice. So I'm trustee on three different trusts. And um, so I use a program to be able to scan documents on my phone called TurboScan. It's an app, right? So I have physically scanned it in as a PDF that's stored in my mobile device, all three trusts. I have hard copy of the trusts. They have hard copies of the trusts. Um, if you just have a single copy and the person that owns the trust is the only one holding on to it right now, what happens if their house burns down? And you can't get a hold of the attorney or they can't remember the contact information for the attorney and the attorney's office has moved twice since they've got it done. I've seen it all. Please, if you're a trustee on a trust, if you're not and you have parents or loved ones that have trusts, please make sure that they have an electronic copy of that trust somewhere stored, that they have hard copy of it in multiple places stored uh, because without it, man, it's gonna be very difficult. <laughs> We came very close to sending Andrew six million dollars worth of transactions just a couple of weeks ago, and yeah. for two missing for two missing trusts. And uh, we we did get as far as consulting, and unfortunately, we were looking at a full probate, um, which, like I said, was motivating. Sorry about that, Andrew, but um, they did did finally find their trust. But I am um I am exhausted with looking for people's trust, especially since. As a wife and a mother myself, I'd be up to my elbows in some boxes looking, you know, if it were me, but you can't. And by the way, in one case, the seller invited us to come go through his house. And I obviously could not accept that uh, invitation uh, to go through the boxes where he thought he might or might not have it. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, even when offered the chance to dig for it, I couldn't. But um, it's very important not to lose that trust. One way I can help with those situations, I'm part of a uh, listserv where there's uh, a couple hundred or possibly a couple thousand attorneys in Southern California. And uh, someone reaches out to me and says, hey, we, we lost the trust. I can just send an email to all these different trust and estates attorneys uh, saying, hey, here's the address of the property and here are the people's names. Was this the client of anyone we're looking for the trust? And sometimes it's actually successful. When the attorney reaches out to me, we're able to find it that way and we're good to go. So happy to do that, no charge. Uh, just you know, happy to help try to locate that. And then my standard practice when I write up trust is um, I get a full scan of the estate plan after it's written up and I store it securely on the cloud uh, with a company that's based in Sunnyvale, California. And then I like to email the client with uh, the full scan as well. So they can just quickly email it to any family or friends they feel uh, needs it. So we get in as many hands as possible. Um, because yeah, if you, lose, if you lose your original documents, uh, we may have to go to probate court to determine um, who, who gets the property. I mean, you know, a scanned copy is better than no copy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we don't know if it's been updated from that last scan or what have you, but if it's the only thing to go by, um, something's better than nothing by far. We yeah. We also had the fun one this week where they, or last week where they, um, they deeded into a corporation ahead of creating the corporation. Um, they meant to create the corporation and they went ahead and deeded and then just forgot about the whole thing. So Andrew's in the middle of sorting that one out um, for us. It is a non-existent corporation with no directors, no, no anything. So um, there was no choice, but straight to the lawyers for that one. Yeah. And for the, agents and stuff out there. The reason why Andrew and I and MJ see so many of these deeds is because the county will record anything. You can hand fill out a deed, go down, have it notarized and submit it and they'll record it. They're, they're, they're not there to check accuracy or anything else. And so we see so many uninsured deeds. So when a deed is hand recorded, by an individual and not through a title company, it's an uninsured, it's classified as an uninsured deed. We see so many uninsured deeds. Some of these transactions that I've pushed to Andrew, we've seen like six to eight uninsured deeds. And from a title perspective, when that property goes to sell is we have to go back and verify that each of those transfers was done accurately and lawfully. 
or we can't move forward with ensuring the transaction. And, and what, whether there was money intended or not intended. Um, well, we find we find so many mistakes where it started from like you know one name and then the name is different and then how they held title and then the different one has changed and somebody's added and removed and then somebody's put back on title. It's like there's so many moving parts sometimes that it's extremely frustrating. Um, and in some cases, I've had cases where I look at it and say, we, we just can't do anything with it. Unless we can locate person A and person C, we're at a standstill. And, uh, you know, I had one where the gal said uh, her mother had deeded off of title and added the daughter to title, basically gifted the house to her. But we had no documentation that that was lawfully done or legally done or anything. And we said, well, we need to get in contact with her. Is she still alive? She says, as far as I know. I said, well, have you had contact with her? She says, I haven't had contact with her in five years. She lives in a small village down in Mexico and we have no communication. Um, and we're like, to... well, we can't do anything until we can get in contact with her. And it, that house to... still has not moved. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tommy, I keep stepping on you. I apologize. Um, I wanted to uh, thank Andrew for bringing this to our attention again. I have, um, I have a lifelong love of real estate and I have recommitted myself to not knowing what I don't know as of listening <laughs> to this uh, today because we do wind up saying a lot of joint tenancy and some, some basic things that we, we don't want to. So we're grateful for that. Um, is there, are there any last thoughts, Andrew? Just before we stop the recording, I wanna remind you all that we stay on until everybody has left the chat. So I just wanna wrap up in case those who have other appointments need to go. Um, any other, any last thoughts for us, Andrew, before we let you go? I just wanted to respond to Daryl's uh, message in the chat. And absolutely, I would be happy to do a seminar on Lake Elsinore or um, anywhere anybody wants me to speak. Uh, very passionate about this and just reach out to me. And uh, if there are other mediums where I can Get the word out and spread this information. I'm all for it. Thank, thank you very much for bringing that to our attention. And thank you for, for participating today and asking such wonderful questions. It really helps validate to, to us, you know, Mary Jane and Tommy, it feels good to have people come and ask such intelligent questions. So we appreciate you very much. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks, Andrew. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to try to set something up, you know, here shortly because we have folks are coming to the office that, you know, either are the, you know, relatives have passed or their trust have not been updated. And it just seems like, you know, we get two to three a week. And I know some of the scenarios that MJ and Tommy have been discussing were a good portion of them were probably out of our office. <laughs> so yeah. thank you in advance for, <laughs> for work, working and continuing working on some of these, uh, you know, solutions for us. You know, this wasn't a probate or uh, this wasn't a probate class, but one of the details that we give 